common modalités de gouvernance. Well, we have just spent uh, two and a half uh, intense days here at the e Commons and Economics Conference in Berlin together and we have been working together in the stream called Knowledge Code and Science as a Commons. I guess that idea of knowledge as a commons um, has to be explained a bit. What is, what is your, um, how do you conceive knowledge? Why, why, why would you um, describe knowledge as a commons? Well, let's start with language. It's uh, something that we all share and uh, grapple with collectively and develop it collectively. And the access to language is open by default. It's not exclusive by default. And, um, but yet we have to protect it in a sense collectively, not in the sense of having a national language body, but um, in the sense of keeping it true to our expressing our culture accurately. So. Yeah, I think when we talk about knowledge, it's much larger than just say science or specific to even say language, but really the complex of what we know and what we need to produce and to reproduce ourselves. That would be really knowledge in the largest sense of the term. So I would say that that has been in the commons and also has always been also enclosed. So we have enclosures of knowledge right from the beginning of private property. So if you look at that, the contesting contestation between knowledge as commons and knowledge as private property is really old. And it's, I think, time for us to reverse this process and establish that knowledge is something which is shared by humanity as a whole, and it should be accessible, usable to produce and reproduce life as we know it. Sometimes in, in, in the commons debate, there is this kind of um, categorization, which is very common, of the natural commons on one side and knowledge commons on the other side. And um, there was a sentence uh, quite frequently used in the conference that every commons is a knowledge commons. What do you think about this? Well, I think it's, uh, after it's stated, I mean, it's almost uh, tautologically, it's almost tautological that, of course, shared knowledge is necessary to do something together. Um, but an, uh, you put it, put it together with another statement that uh, commons only exist with commoning, um, then maybe it becomes more interesting. It evokes, evokes how that shared knowledge has to be um, co-developed, if you will. Um, I also want to go back really quick to something Prabir said. I actually think that the enclosure of knowledge is older than at least modern conceptions of private property. It's always been, uh, you know, used as a not sharing knowledge. Keeping secrets have always been used as a tool for, you know, those who already have power to. Um, keep the powerless oppressed. Mike, when I meant, uh, I really meant agrarian, start of agrarian yeah. societies. Yes. Yeah. So the minute you get land as private property, you right. also start getting enclosures of knowledge because agrarian society needs the study of skies to know when to plant, basically the calendar. And calendar becomes a source of power for the priestly class, right. whether it's Egypt, right. whether it's caste Hindus in India, for instance, the Brahmins, right. or you take the church later on, which really sets a calendar, right. sets a time of the day. So, you know, these are all essentially enclosures of power, but it is not commodity. What you see in modern times, knowledge is a commodity, and that can be bought and sold, and I think that gives it a different character. But if we look at 
power as, a, as, a, as, as something which existed in societies, it's really with private property I would date that knowledge and closure really starts. But we can debate on that. Yeah. Um, so jumping. Um, so I think the knowledge commons or digital commons as the way it is today started from this criticism of copyright law and how it has expanded so uh, extensively and covering so many things and become so long a protection for probably no very not very good reasons. Um, so this kind of challenge of copyright law um, starting from from asking whether the system really help us to move forward, right? But I think my, my, um, my reason of being part of this commons issues is more than that. I, what I wanted to ask is what, it, what is a valuable, who says what kind of knowledge is valuable, right? So um, the commons movement, I think we all have to admit the digital commons movement started by people who are relatively well, well off in society, right? So we have been looking at a lot of different kind of commons in, in this conference um, with natural commons, and there are people who do not really have such easy access to computers and produce those knowledge that can be copyrightable and in, in legal terms is sometimes very crude. It's whether in US law is whether it is fixed, the idea is fixed, if it's an idea is not copyrightable, if it's fixation, then it's copyrightable. So how do you distinguish what is valuable and what should be protected, whether it is in, is it just because some, we live in a return culture, then we have more ways to, for us to enclosure our knowledge, and if we don't, then we are doomed because our things are not considered as copyrightable, and then therefore it's in the public domain, and then can be easily taken to be used by others. Or, you know, how do we evaluate what is value, what, what kind of knowledge should, can um, teach us things? What you're just asking is who decides what is valuable? has always been a question because uh, the keynote speaker at the conference brought to our attention that uh, uh, it's all about control, basically. That the one who controls information and the one who controls knowledge has power. Power derives directly from the control of knowledge. So, and as we heard before, there's nothing new at all in history that the control of knowledge is related to power struggles in society. So um, I would like you to point out perhaps three or four of those power struggles around knowledge and the knowledge commons, or the enclosure or the defense of the knowledge commons going on in your regions where you come from or in your um, realms of activity. So, um, yes, so Carolina Botero mentioned this, like control to control knowledge and information is to have power, right? And I think that is, of course, why the digital commons criticizing copyright law, criticizing the entertainment or the content industry, and trying to get the information back to society, right? So they say information should be free. Um, but there, there's also, there has always been this conflict between indigenous communities and, and, and the free culture communities, whether every knowledge should be free to everyone and freely accessible to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, while I wanted to, while I wanted to have the digital commons people to think about, I would not admit, I would not, I would of course admit they're doing very valuable work, right? But at the same time, I think if their goal, if what they're, they're, enemy, let's say, if the people who they want to take the power back from is the entertainment content industry or, you know, publishers, academia, then they have to think about there are different kind of struggles, different kind of power relations other communities are dealing with. So for indigenous communities, they have been dealing with how the state has been taking their land, right? And how the indigenous, how the anthropologists have been interpreting what they are for them or what these means in their heritage for them. So taking back that is one way of taking back power for the marginalized communities, right? And at, that, at this moment, they don't have the kind of copyright to help them as the digital commons. 
but do they really don't have any rights if they try to claim rights, if they try to say what we produce according to, to the copyright law, actually we can get ownership, we can get authorship. Do we criticize them? How do we try to find the a way to reconcile this kind of conflict? Because it is an unfortunate conflict. I think that's an important point when we come to traditional knowledge or traditional artifacts, traditional handicrafts, you come to traditional music and so on. There's a whole traditions that have then sought by the entertainment industry to be privatized, if you will, and how do you protect it? And I think there is a huge issue over there to declare it as public property, public domain, is also then depriving them of their livelihood in lots of cases. So there is a huge issue over there, how do you do it? And traditional existing copyright law or existing patent law does not recognize this. It only recognizes you know, individual alienable rights that can be, in that sense, given out because you really want to do it for commerce. But coming up to the question of struggles that you mentioned, of course, in India, the one of the biggest struggle is about pharmaceutical products. As you know, India did not have a product patent regime. It's a 1917 law which allowed the whole pharmaceutical industry in India to develop and resulted in what's called now the generic medis medicines and the talk about India being the pharmacy of the poor and so on. But it really meant the prices came down dramatically. Now, of course, with WTO, TRIPS Agreement 94, we lost the battle. The TRIPS Agreement came in. So we fought the a real guard TRIPS Agreement, battle. which is? Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement. Within the WTO, WTO. the World Trade Organization right. framework. That's right. WTO and the TRIPS Agreement are coterminous because it came in the GATT negotiations, which originally, originally did not have intellectual property rights as a part of the trade negotiations. It was brought in actually by pharmaceutical companies again. And the pharmaceutical and chemical companies brought it in. It finally became the position of the developed countries. And it was finally accepted by all the countries after a long battle. Let's put it that we lost the battle in when this TRIPS agreement came out. And India in 2005 was forced to change the patent to allow for product patents. So we had a defensive battle, how much we can then reduce the ambit of the patents. That is what is called TRIPS flexibility. So within TRIPS flexibilities, you can reduce the scope of the product patents, but you can't do away with it. So we did lots of things. And again, this was a big battle in India. We managed to get a lot of things in. And that was finally what recently was a Novartis by verdict, by which Glivec as a, as a life-saving drug, which is which was going to cost about 20 times what it thought even higher than what it is in the generic version, was finally the patent was struck down or not accepted. So that, those are the kind of battles we are fighting. But let's face it, facing, it's a, let's face it, it's a rear guard battle. It's not the main frontal battle we need to fight, which is how do you make medicine accessible to the poorer sections? And also to the large number of people who, who are not paying customers, and therefore there is no research for developing medicines for them. So what are called neglected diseases, it's not really neglected diseases, but neglected people, because they don't have the purchasing power, therefore they're not a market. So those are the kind of battles we have to fight, which we are talking about how to develop common strategy for what's called open source drug discovery. And I think that's a very interesting area of work that we need to enlarge on. So what, what one could, could put it that way, um, research for the commons is not profitab profitable and therefore it's not done. And That's why it's not done because if we, if we don't have the, so malaria victims don't have the purchasing power, they can't pay much. So it's not attractive for companies to do research on that. And the governments, of course, are not uh, too interested in doing it at the moment because they're in a mode of withdrawal from all this as much as they can. So this is the crux of the issue. But again, interestingly enough, we have a huge initiative for what is called open source drug discovery. It's again something that we can discuss later. I would today. like to discuss this issue of openness versus the need for protection a little later and, and perhaps ask you to bring you into the debate uh, what, what are ongoing struggles um, around the knowledge commons and closures of the commons are you would like to bring to our attention. Uh, I'm a piracy researcher uh, doing work on uh, those who try other uh, ways and modes of resisting uh, or fighting uh, trends that uh, works in the way of commodification and appropriation of, of, uh, of 
of, uh, of knowledge. Um, and of course, one way is to, to work in the international political uh, arena and try to uh, work with international institutions and try to uh, somehow tweak the regulation uh, in favor of uh, uh, of certain uh, disadvantaged groups or certain uh, groups of countries, uh, but there is of course another way of uh, of solving all these problems, and that is the legal way. That is the uh, that is the uh, the criminal way or the criminalized way of uh, taking away uh, what uh, we think belongs to us, uh, and th that spans from people pirating Lady Gaga songs to state-sponsored uh, uh, transfer, illegal transfer of uh, patents and, uh, and design and intellectual properties on which many uh, developing countries' development agenda is uh, based on and uh, I think and has been based on in, uh, in the past as well. So uh, I think it's um, uh, this uh, ho however we define knowledge commons is just a, a, a whole range of, uh, of activities and groups with different means uh, more or less trying to work into the same uh, direction and I, uh, the question is for me at least this is my personal interest is who is, who is more powerful uh, developed countries might beat developing countries in the WTO easily or not that easily but eventually uh, on the other hand, it seems like the, the enforcement of those same rules has some serious problems. Uh, so for me, the, the issues that you mentioned with intellectual property uh, are not that tragic, because what I see is that intellectual property protection has never been more uh, broad and uh, has never been stronger, but in the very same instance, in the very same time, it has never been weaker either. Uh, and that's What do you mean by that? It has never been weaker in, in, in which sense? Uh, in, in terms of uh, the capability of enforcing uh, systematic infringement of intellectual property rights. So there are the rules, uh, but uh, there are the tools to, uh, to step up against uh, uh, the violation of those rules is uh, somewhat mm -hmm. limited. Uh, and that uh, as long as that uh, limitation is there, there is always room there are always wide spots on the map where alternatives can flourish, innovation can happen, uh, and uh, and just as you know, the, at, at the more traditional warfare, it's like what do you do with those tribes at the borderland between Afghanistan and Pakistan? It, even the the largest military force cannot really uh, fight them. You have to somehow conform to them and pacify them and make concessions to them. So as long as there are those wide spaces on the map. Of enforcement, or there are wide spaces of the map in terms of knowledge commons, then they can act as a as a force which is able to uh, exert some level of control over the flows and processes happening in the more institutionalized arena. So uh, and therefore shift the power that that was yeah, exactly. the idea. Yeah, yeah. exactly. One could even argue that the fact that it is weakening physically is the reason why the legal structure is supposedly strengthening. Yeah, exactly. That is in fact because it's weaker, that therefore the laws are being strengthened to offset that. And that's always a losing game. Yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to come back to this issue um, uh, and actually to, to finish with, with an assessment, with your assessment of um, where are we at with challenging the current paradigm of private property on knowledge, code and science. And um, are we really challenging the power relations? And because the price of further enclosures and pushing forward the, the idea of individual property on knowledge is high. It, it might be right that it is weak but the price for it is criminalization of huge parts of the population, right? As you said, they might go for illegal means to fight against enclosures, and this allows the power structures to criminal criminalize them. But before we finish with that idea, I would like to come back to that tension between openness 
and protection. And there is in the knowledge comment a huge stand for openness, free access to knowledge, so that we all might have a fair share and further build upon and further develop to fulfill human, to meet human needs. And at the same time you pointed out that there is a tension and there was an intriguing question in the, in the conference. Do we really want to open the knowledge commons for enclosures? What do you think? What do you mean by enclosures? What are the enclosures? Exactly. Well, for instance, <laughs> those, those who it might be market forces or the state, those who do the TRIPS law, um, uh, those who um, put knowledge, who conceive knowledge as commodity and conceive the production and reproduction of knowledge as something that has to be sold on the market. I know that something that should be freely shared and built upon in order to produce the best benefit for the whole society. It might be the pharmaceutical industry, it might be uh, the telecorporations, it might be even those who politically support the legal structures mm, to um, further enclose knowledge and, and science and code. So what you're saying is that if we have knowledge in the public domain and do not protect it, it can actually lead to enclosures of the public knowledge. Is that what you're saying? It can actually be Legal. easily appropriated. Appropriated. Exactly. So therefore, mm -hmm. how do you protect against exactly. it? Now, of course, how do you protect against it is a continuous battle. There is no uh, universal panacea to the issue. And it depends on how the courts interpret the law, what the laws are, and what kind of fights you do. And what do the scientific community, if it comes to sciences, what do they do? If the scientific community decides that they're all going to patent, of course there is a problem. But if the huge part of the scientific community says, no, we do not want to do it because that's not the way of science and we'd like to put it in public domain and we'll fight to see that it is always put in public domain in a way that it cannot be patented, then that's, that's the way it's going to be. So I don't think there are easy answers to this question, but it is true that the final battle is not whether it can or cannot be enclosed. The real battle is how do you produce knowledge better? And if the patent system ends up the private or privatization of knowledge system can produce knowledge much better than what we are arguing, then it is true for the time being they'll win. The whole issue today is that whether it is software, whether it is science, it's clear that you work collaboratively, you work in open systems, you exchange openly, transparently, you publish all your results as much as you can. What happens is the science grows much faster. So what you do as sciences, shall I say, as an active producer of science, it's through production you beat the other side, not through reproduction. And I think that's the key issue, that whether it is free software or it is this, or it is the question of sciences, it's really which is a better productive system for producing quality, research quality products and so on, that will really be it. And I think on that side, the openness is currently winning the battle, whether it is software or whether it is really science. And I think that's a big optimism I have. So would, did you, you would basically agree that um, commoners contribute to um, uh, free uh, code that is then released as free software and, and then Google, Google and whoever can use it and build upon their business strategy and become an even richer corporation than it already is, mining the data of all those of us who contribute to well, for this. The, the and essentially, Prabir is arguing that mm -hmm. the commons or commons institutions need to be better at producing knowledge than, than non-commons institutions. And, but that provisioning doesn't just include the raw knowledge. It has to include whatever the knowledge is embedded in that makes it valuable. So in the case of Google, for example, um, the commons has been very good at creating the software. It has not been very good at creating, at, uh, creating services that 
realize a lot of value from that software. So of the top 100 websites, I think only one, the number five one, Wikipedia, is run by uh, an institution that you might think of as a commons institution. So I think I think that's a huge problem. We need um, we need all of the top 100 websites to be run by commons institutions, and that and that's just you know in the software arena. I think there are a lot of other arenas um, you know where the products of scientific research are um, whether they're in the open or not. They they end up being marketed um, you know on the market and. Yes. What you say is the rent part of it, which yes. is the monopoly profit part of it. Right. But of course, this does not produce a non-market economy or a commons economy. Sure. What you do is produce knowledge in the commons is that you don't then pay the exorbitant rent which today marks right. the pharmaceutical companies or even the yes. software companies. Yeah. It doesn't make, does not mean that the big capital will not make money. That's a diff that is another battle that we are already on, and that's independent of the battle to produce knowledge as commons. This would be my argument. Go ahead. So from your definition of enclosure, I don't see you uh, include uh, indigenous people's claim to um, their heritage or cultural resources because they are not necessary, you know, putting them into a market, right? So I, I think that is, uh, is one important that are similar between this digital commons or new knowledge commons and traditional knowledge commons, and w or the ways they try to have the property system work for them, which is like the licensing system, right? So what the question you're asking us basically is if we prefer a copyleft license to a, just a free license with a copyleft clause, right? But the reason there is a copyleft license is because they can manipulate or hack the copyright system, the property system that works, that used to have worked for the other side and have now worked for them, right? So the indigenous claim to heritage, heritage and cultural resources doesn't have to be on the, the bad side for the digital commons people. And that's just one thing I want to point out because they are both communities trying to protect themselves, but what there is in the legal system for them to help to protect themselves is now the property system and how to hack them. But of course, there's always this debate we have always had is if we use this tool, do we get to, uh, do we get to caught up in the nitty uh, gritty parts of this tool that eventually led us into a debate of which license and details of license without really thinking the, the bigger goal, that why we even initially chose something and which goal we're serving. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you think that, um, the, for instance, the knowledge you free, you take back, by whatever means available to the public domain should then be protected. Are there any ideas of how to protect the knowledge to stay forever in the public domain and don't be reappropriated? Oh, to think about this issue. And, um, well, I'm, I'm a very pr pragmatist in this issue and I see that as long as technology enables us the creation of these wise spaces on the map, uh, then it, uh, as for that long, we are pretty safe. So what I, what I deal is uh, shadow libraries, illegal text archives, millions of books, scientific academic books uh, that are out there in various servers from Ukraine to Ireland to Russia. And, uh, you know, the life cycle of these illegal, ar uh, illegal archives, which uh, are uh, facilitating an immense and unprecedented uh, transfer of knowledge from the producers in Western, mostly American uh, universities. Can you give us an idea in the quantity? Uh, in terms of usage or in terms of uh, titles? In terms of titles, that's around two million. In terms of usage, it's um, a monthly millions and millions of downloads into Iran, into India, into Indonesia, into China, into Poland, into Hungary, into Iceland, into uh, South Africa, uh, all over the map, all over the world. So there is a, this in, immense underground river, which is there because the technology enables its existence. Uh, and uh, I don't really care their legal status. I, I, it's like, really, I don't care. As long as they are somewhere there, uh, I don't care if they are in the public domain. Uh, but, and that's, that's a very uh, crucial but, 
if those that if the, the doors on technology close down, uh, then we have a problem. Uh, if the te if the com if the if the technologies of communicating uh, are controlled, if the technologies of uh, of reading and writing are controlled and filtered and monitored, then we have a problem. So f for me, uh, technology is a savior in a sense that it enables. Uh, circumventing all these theoretical, legal, political hurdles because just because we can. Uh, and uh, f for me, uh, in this sense, uh, the most important task is to keep this technological freedom open uh, because then we always have a plan B. If, it, if it's closed, then we are in a much more difficult situation. It works for software, knowledge, copyright, but it doesn't work for patenting system, for instance, you know, so, or yeah. for any tangible artifact, yeah. the problem still exists. So yeah. that battle still would be yeah. on. Yeah. I agree with you that copyright can be broken much more easily because of technical uh, advances that are there, yeah. but that's not true for a whole bunch of other knowledge knowledge issues. But, yeah, that, but that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that this part, therefore, doesn't. Yeah, but, uh, but then, then it comes to 3D printing stuff, right? <laughs> then you can you know, download the, the, the blueprint for the gun or for a printer or <laughs> for a, a shoe or for a, for a DNA replicator. Then, then you know, things start to change. And uh, I, 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 I might, might be more uh, uh, clo close to, to seeing these trends, but I don't think that's a, that's a, a science fiction idea that we are able, to, we are going to be able to produce more and more ourselves. There, it's not a science fiction idea, but I'm not as sanguine as you. I think essentially the future of technology is being distorted by the by the collateral. It's collateral damage of the copyright wars, and even though it's possible for people who know how to access these uh, people who are preserving culture, which I greatly admire, um, the internet is probably more centralized now than it would have been without those wars. For, I mean, for a long time, researchers have been fearful about doing peer-to-peer -peer research, for example. And uh, I mean, it's easy to imagine a world in which things are much more centralized even than they are now. For example, what if, uh, what if running a web search engine had required a license from content owners? You would probably have, uh, you know, you would still have an AOL-like universe where you had to go to one centralized place that could acquire a lot of licenses. So it's easy to imagine a world far where technology is uh, either more distorted by the legal and illegality or, or a lot less. And I. The only reason, um, well, not the only, but I mean, the reason I can't say like you that I don't care about the legal status is that it does fundamentally warp the infrastructure of technology and thus the infrastructure of of society. And and to pr we talked about the kind of product enclosure before, basically where a company takes some knowledge and then builds a slightly better product that can, that can be provisioned in the co provisioned in the commons and then profits right. There's also the using existing law to enclose, like taking a public domain thing, changing it a little bit, and then it's not in the public domain anymore. And fundament, the, the copy left is an attempted protection against that. It's important. But the more fundamental way is to just change the law so that it's not possible to use the law to enclose things. So I mean, the a weak version of that is like preventing copy fraud so that just make it harder, increase the uh, minimum requirements. Uh, for removing something from the public domain, or of course abolition at the other end, or even further than that, forced uh, regulation, which forces transparency. Just, just let me uh, add one idea to that idea that if we cannot resolve all those problems with technology and hope that never a communist will print out a three, d uh, three, uh, d gun, what? never. Uh, that. Uh, Right, that's the more, most we important might, uh, okay. commons problem now. It's, uh, mm -hmm. That the gun, gun design is in the commons. Now. Exactly, the gun design is in the commons now. That might be an issue to be discussed in the next interview. So, but I guess we can agree about that. It's all about control, and what I understood is that it's not only about knowledge as a commons, but basically putting the provisioning of knowledge, production of knowledge into the commons as a commoning process and that means free technologies and free infrastructure infrastructures and relates 
to the other streams of the conference we have just been in. Thank <laughs> you.